Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Why are so many of us familiar with the words to, if I were a rich man? Why are we so moved by the plaintive beauty of sunrise, sunset? And why do we identify so deeply with Tevye, the Jewish milkman, as he tries to control his rebellious daughters in their Russian village in Tsarist Russia? Theater critic and Columbia University professor, Alisa Solomon, answers those questions in her new book, Wonder of Wonders, A Cultural History of Fiddler on the Roof. In it, she describes how Tevye's story, told by Yiddish writer Sholem Aleichem in stories written at the turn of the 20th century, evolved into one of the best loved modern musicals of all time, and one that speaks to all of us, whether Jewish or Gentile. Her book has just been published by the Metropolitan Books imprint of Henry Holt and Company. Welcome. Thank you. You've been writing about theater for a long time. What made you want to write a book about this play? Oh, so many things uh, sort of pointed me in this direction. Primarily, my interest in Jewish culture and Yiddish literature that I'd been kind of harboring for a long time but hadn't ever done any real writing about. And in 2004, there was a revival announced of Fiddler on Broadway. And at the time, I was still writing for the Village Voice, and I proposed a feature story about it, I, a kind of preview piece. I hadn't thought about the show in a lot of years. And I pitched an idea that was like, why do we need this show? Why do we need to see this again? Um, we're in a place of great Jewish uh, achievement and um, power, even. And why do we need a show about these, these weak, suffering um, Jews? And my editor said, OK, fine, go ahead, see what you come up with. So the first thing I had to do was refamiliarize myself with the show. And I went and bought the CD. You could still do that in those days. And um, brought it home. Two bars in, I started crying. And I thought, OK, um, cynicism is not the proper approach. I have to be honest with the feelings that are coming up from this. So what is it? You know, exactly those questions you just asked. You know, what is it that makes this show so powerful? Mm -hmm. And that, that was really the seed of, of the idea. OK. Of now, Sholem Aleichem, was he orthodox? Well, oh. those, those categories are really hard to apply to the Pale of Settlement in the 19th century. Um, they're, they're really much more um, modern descriptions, urban descriptions of divisions that sort of happened later. But y yes, he grew up in an observant family, okay. but not, not as a Hasid. He didn't follow a particular Rebbe um, uh, as the Hasidim did. OK. Now, he's probably the most celebrated Yiddish writer of all time, probably. Probably. Yeah. Um, what was so important about his stories? He, he was one of the first of the Yiddish writers who came to be known as the classic writers. Um, and they pretty much created a modern Yiddish literature out of whole cloth. Yiddish had been thought of as a lesser language. It was a vernacular um, spoken by everyday Jews and their everyday activities. And Hebrew, of course, was the language of prayer and was the more elevated language. And when, when in, in the, the sort of Jewish nationalistic or, or culturally nationalistic movements started to arise in the 19th century along with other kinds of, of um, cultural identifications and nationalistic movements, there was a big debate over what should be the language of the Jews, um, Hebrew or Yiddish, which was the widely spoken language. And uh, also with the rise of the Jewish Enlightenment that um, tried to modernize, was, was a modernizing force in those communities, there was the idea that people would be uplifted through a literature in the language that they spoke. And so there was a push for a Yiddish literature to kind of, um, you know, raise up the masses, as it were. Um, but it really blossomed in no time into a vibrant, critical, multi-layered, texture, uh, critical literature. Mm -hmm. And Shalom was a very big part of that. Now, he came to New York, I think, in, in around 1906, hoping to find success uh, on the, in the Yiddish theater here. here. Um, but his plays flopped. Right. Why? Well, he wrote stories of all kinds. Um, he's most remembered for writing stories about the 
the, the little people, as he called them, the people of the shtetl, of the small market towns, well, sometimes big market, the market towns that had large Jewish populations, but were not exclusively Jewish. It's a kind of myth of the shtetl that's come, uh, come down to us. Um, but he, he wrote about these, um, th these people in, among other things, he also wrote about urban people, but he was best known for these shtetl stories. And when he tried to make it in the Yiddish theater in New York, the audiences here were not interested in those stories. They were forging a new urban American identity. And even though the Yiddish theater was a place where they could think about their homes, um, you know, the old country and so on, they wanted to think about it in tension with the new. Um, and to, um, and, and, and in the communal form of the theater to forge this new identity. And Shol Malachim seemed backwards to them. And so his plays just didn't make it at all. They were too assimilated for him, basically. Yes, no? Uh, I, I don't know if I'd call it assimilated. Um, I'd, I'd say they were, um, they, 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 they were looking for a different means of cultural expression. Okay. So it, it was really not until after his death that his, his plays, or plays based on his writings, started to be produced here, first in Yiddish, mm -hmm. and, then, and then in English. Um, so at some point, Joseph Stein, who had written for television and had written, I guess, the books for several Broadway shows, got together with Jerry Bach, the composer, and Sheldon Harnick, the lyricist, and started looking at Aleichem short stories as a possible source for a new musical. Um, they approached Hal Prince about it, directing it, but he was busy, and they approached Joan Robbins, Jerome Robbins, who had been very successful as both a choreographer and as a, um, a, a musical director. Now, Robbins, it was interesting, he was somebody who had distanced himself from his Jewishness. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't really want to be a Jew, you know. Um, so what drew him? to this musical. Yeah, that was one of the most interesting aspects of, of this story I found as I was doing the research. And I spent quite a bit of time in the voluminous Jerome Robbins papers at the, at the public library here. And uh, in his diaries and notes and so on, um, as you just said, Cheryl, he, he, he referred to his younger days of not wanting to be Jewish, of wanting to run away from that identity. He was very ashamed of it. Um, in some ways that are, I think, familiar to any generation with immigrant parents, they have accents, they seem weird to your friends, you know, all of the, the, that, that impulse to assimilate and fit in with the other kids um, was part of it. And he even said things in his, in his notes, like he, he studied ballet in order to take on a different physical um, uh, identity even, or, or kind of comportment that was not the, um, the wimpy, stooped over idea of masculinity that he associated with his uh, Jewish father and forebears. Nonetheless, he had had some very positive experiences and connections to that heritage, including a trip to visit his grandfather in the old shtetl in the 20s when Jerome Robbins was six years old. And he remained very um, sort of wistful and sentimental about that experience. And, and as he got older, he became interested in that culture that he had discarded. He, he realized that there was a richness there that uh, he, had, he had missed. And when this script came, um, Bach and Harnick and Stein had worked on it for a while before they approached Robbins, and they had a draft script already. And uh, when it came, it really sparked something in him. Now, how did the main uh, creators of the show prepare for it. I mean, they did a whole lot of research. Yeah, they did. Um, all of them came from Jewish backgrounds, though Joe Stein was the only one of the four who had grown up in a family that spoke Yiddish. And all of them were, well, none of them was religiously observant. And even though they had some association or ties to the world that Shlomo Echem had depicted in his stories, they, they were very distant from it. And so they did do a lot of research, Robbins especially. He was, he always did a ton of research for his work, but this one he really threw himself into, I think because there was such a, a so much personally at stake for him in the project. So they, they read books, they looked at films, and I think most importantly, they did what, what you really only can call ethnographic field work. They, they went to the Orthodox and Hasidic communities 
um, in Brooklyn to weddings in the big hotels. Then sometimes undercover. Sometimes undercover, yeah, to observe the, the ceremonies and, and especially to observe the dancing that, that really, um, really impressed Robbins. By the, the robustness, the, ma the masculinity of, yeah, the, of, the, exactly. of the men. Of the exactly. men of the men the dance. virile ferocity. He right, thought. right. Yeah. Um, and as they started putting the, the and, and Robbins was always asking, as they started to put it together, what is the show about? Mm -hmm. And uh, he decided it was basically about the breaking down of tradition, you right. know, uh, or the tension between tradition and, and change. And the, he had his theme. Well, we're going to take a short break. Then we'll be back with more with Elisa Solomon, author of Wonder of Wonders, A Cultural History of Fiddler on the Roof, after this message. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Elisa Solomon, author of Wonder of Wonders, A Cultural History of Fiddler on the Roof. It's just been published by the Metropolitan Books imprint of Henry Holt and Company. Zero Mostel was always the first choice to play mm -hmm. Tevye. Is it Tevye? Yeah. Tevye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what was he like? Um, brilliant, obstreperous, um, just spilling with talent and unable, you know, and, and kind of unfiltered as a personality. Um, kind of crude and, and raucous. Yeah, 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 yeah <laughs> rambunctious. Right. Um, he and Robbins did not like each other. No, they did not like each other, and it was personal as well as political. Uh, Robbins had infamously named names in, before the House Un-American Activities Committee, and Mostel had been blacklisted for his political activity, and so they had a big clash um, starting right there. But their, their personalities were also quite different. You know, Robbins was very, you know, contained and proper in his, um, you know, approach to things. Um, and, you know, as I just said, um, Mostel was just um, kind of spilling out all over the place. And unabashedly a Jew, you know, I don't yeah. care if you like it or not, yeah. which Robbins had, had always tried to sort of suppress his. Um, what was it like working with Robbins for the actors, the designers, the costume designer? He was pretty uh, obsessive, right? He was very obsessive and tough. And I, I, I think, you know, in all fairness, toughest of all on himself. Um, he, f he was a brilliant choreographer and, and a great director and, and understood dramatic structure uh, and, and the machinery of a musical probably better than anyone of his generation. Um, you know, he made West Side Story. I mean, he, you know, he, he did a lot of um, amazing work. And he was incredibly exacting. And he was insecure about himself as a director about working with actors. And he kind of took it out on the actors. And he could be very cruel and cutting to people that he worked with. And because of his perfectionism, he could drive people crazy. Boris Aronson, the set designer, um, was one who was famously driven crazy by Robbins wanting to change things, you know, just a little bit all the time. And he would bring new ideas. He was brimming with ideas. And, and Robbins was inspired. He went to everything. He went to art exhibits, off-Broadway, you know, uh, crazy performances in obscure downtown places, and, and Broadway, the ballet, the opera, everything. And, and everything fed his imagination. And he would come to Boris Aronson or others and say, oh, I just saw something um, really fantastic, and it's given me an idea. Can you do something like this? But the next day, he'd have something else in mind. And the thing like this already um, was something to discard. You write about the creation of the bottle dance. Uh huh. Well, the bottle dance is, I think, one of the most interesting um, additions to the show. The show rehearsed in New York in the summer of 1963 and, uh, sorry, 1964, in June 64. Then it went on, on the road for tryouts in Detroit and then Washington and then came back to open here. And, and the bottle dance didn't come in until Washington, That's right? That's right, yeah. And the bottle dance came in after the show had been reviewed in Washington. I mean, the show was basically done, and then this show-stopping number um, was added in Washington. Robbins had been inspired by those weddings that he'd gone to that we talked about a second ago. He'd seen one man tottering around with a bottle on his head um, doing a flash and what was called a flash and taunt. So it was kind of a shtick of um, trying to, to entertain the bride and groom, sort of pretend to be sober when you're really drunk as the idea. And he took that one guy tottering around and turned it into a 
an elaborate show-stopping number. Where the dancers had to dance balance bottles yep. on their heads. Balance bottles the on their heads, yeah. And um, they, he called the dancers for, uh, uh, to learn it into the lobby um, in Washington where they were working uh, because the lobby was carpeted and he knew some bottles were going to be falling to the ground. And in the space of a couple hours, he taught them those movements. And some of the dancers I interviewed told me that actually harder than balancing the bottles was this kind of frenzied movement that they do after the bottles come off their heads at the end of the dance, the, the, the whips um, and, and so on, as they called it. So the play opens on September 22nd, 1964, and the reaction was, what was the reaction? The reaction, was, the reaction among audiences was over the top. The, the reviews were generally quite favorable, though not universally. There were some, some quibbles here and there. But there were lines around the box office, and the show ran for, I think it's, uh, I, th I, I think the show ran for well over two years before it had an empty seat or even an empty standing room spot. And it opened in September, and by February, uh, Hal Prince, who had joined as a, uh, had come on as a producer, co-producer, was he co-producer? Well, he, he, long story, but essentially he was the producer. Okay, the yeah. uh, but by February, he was paying distributions to the investors. That's right. right? That's, That's right. amazing. It, yeah. Do you know how, how what kind of profit it made over time? The Broadway production. Oh God, it's. But at one point it was thirteen hundred percent. Yeah, thirteen hundred percent, probably well higher. Okay. By now. Okay. Yeah. What was it about Fiddler that resonated so strongly with audiences? The the show operates successfully on two tracks: the particular and the universal tracks. It's so it can speak to everyone on themes of generational conflict, cultural change, the struggle to sustain traditions in the face of modernization, and um, and just the turmoil that any kind of social change brings. That's those are universal themes, and they they were related to by everyone who came. At the same time, it's a show specifically about a Jewish community in a particular context, and that spoke directly to Jews who were really hailed by the show and, and saw themselves and their heritage in it. And this was the first work of popular culture that represented the world of the shuttle. I mean, there'd been books, there'd been exhibits, there'd been recordings of stories and music and so on, but those were things that were mostly consumed in the privacy of the home or in Jewish institutional venues. Here was a Broadway show, you know, before the public at large, representing this vanished world with affection and with pride. And that that was huge for the Jewish community in the middle of the 20th century. You write that the, the show gave the world Jews that it could love. Yeah, yeah. Um, so after the New York opening, the play went, well, it went around the country, it went to a lot of countries. How many countries has it been performed in? Oh, God, uh, dozens and dozens, I think just within a few years. By the time the film came out, the film version in 1971, the show had already been seen in 31 countries. Wow. Wow. Uh, one thing you write about that most people hadn't heard about was the Brooklyn production, yeah. the production by black kids, kids at this, I guess, predominantly black or all black junior high school in Brooklyn at the height of the Ocean Hill Brownsville controversy, which pitted blacks against Jews. Yeah. That was an incredible story to learn about. And, um, and it was very exciting that I was able to make contact with the, the man who directed it and with some of the students who were in it, you know, now all middle aged. Um, and the, the director, Richard Pirro, he, he just died in this last year, I'm sorry to say, was Italian-American guy, brilliant teacher, music and drama teacher in, in this um, school in an impoverished neighborhood of mostly black and Puerto Rican students and a few scattered white kids, and Jewish kids. And uh, in, the, in the midst of this conflagration of the, the fight over community control of the schools that, that, that pitted the community against the mostly Jewish teachers union in a very ugly way, he decided to do Fiddler um, with these mostly black kids in the cast. And there were some Jewish members of the faculty who tried to shut it down. They just assumed that these children were going to be disrespectful um, and make fun of Jews, but that was not at all what they did. They, they were incredibly talented and dedicated um, kids. Because of the, the teachers union strikes, school was closed almost the entire fall of that year and they came into Manhattan to Richard Pirro's little apartment on 16th Street and rehearsed there and, um, and the, the show went on under a lot of, um, a lot of turmoil. How but many they performances? Managed to do it. Was it just one performance? I think they did, I think they did two performances. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, 
Did, did Fiddler create its own mythology about it, Jews? Yes, yes, it absolutely did. And mythology is a good word for it. Um, as I said a little bit earlier, the, we, we have a common idea of the shtetl, for example, that it was a community only of Jews, that it was like a, a, a restricted ghetto, um, which is not at all what the nature of a shtetl was. And um, different shtetls were quite different from each other. Some were rural, some were industrial. Um, they had high proportions of Jews, but they were not exclusively Jewish. So that's, that's one part of the mythology, I think, that we have. The idea of the arranged marriage um, and, and, and the matchmaker is something that um, we ascribe to that world. Is that not, not true? It's not entirely true. The matchmaker, first of all, was typically male, and um, second of all, was really more well-to-do families that, um, that used matchmakers. And so there are all kinds of historical aspects. I mean, it's a Broadway show. You know, right. we, we shouldn't turn to it for uh, documentary accuracy. Um, but nonetheless, it's fed, and, and it's not Fiddler alone that's fed these myths, but, um, but that's, th th there are different aspects of those mythologies that the show um, kind of helped to cement. Mm -hmm. We've got about 30 seconds okay. left. It, how would you describe the legacy of Fiddler? Uh, it's incredibly rich and varied. It's, it's because it's a show um, that itself was changing in form. It was a time, it, it came out at a time that the musical form was changing and it reflects that in its, its theme and it's, is reflected in its form. Um, and therefore I think it's remained very open and accessible to anyone interested in all of the themes that, that it represents. So I think that it, it has uh, a lot of mileage still to go. Well, it's certainly a fascinating book, and Thank I you. would encourage all of our viewers to read it. It's really a fascinating story. Uh, I'm afraid we're out of time, but I want to thank Elisa Solomon for joining me today. Wonder of Wonders, A Cultural History of Fiddler on the Roof has just been published by the Metropolitan Books imprint of Henry Holt and Company. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy. If there are any people you'd like to hear from or topics you'd like us to explore, please let us know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.